God, we come into your presence this morning. And we take this time, Lord, to just still our hearts. We thank you, Jesus, for the greatest sacrifice that you ever gave, that could ever be made, your life for us. Father, we thank you that you are king above the storm. You are king above sickness. You are king above disease. Lord, you are the king of it all. And you are still on the throne. You are ruling. You are reigning. And Lord, in celebration this morning, in victory this morning, we gather. We gather. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. You are the king. You are the king. Bless you, Lord. Hey, church, you can be seated. We are, as you can tell from around you, commemorating Anzac Day today. We do have a number of returned servicemen or women in our church, some of whom are here today. And it's so good to see you, Les, with your beautiful wife, Mari. And Les has his medals on as well. And uh, for anybody else who has served in the armed forces or had family members, uh, we are here today to remember you and to honour you. And we just have a segment in our service now. We have Jason Wright here, who is the band master for the Warwick Nabil Concert Band. Jason is an incredible bugle player and this morning will help us with Anzac Day. You can't see him because he's very loud. And so if he was in here, we would all need earplugs. But Jason's just around the corner. And in just a moment, he will take us through the, uh, <laughs> what are you doing, my boy? The last post. And then we will have a minute silence and then he will play the Ravelli for us as well. So some of you would be familiar with this. Maybe uh, you just need to explain to your children what's happening during this time. Uh, but why don't we read the ode together now? And then if you can stand to your feet for the minute silence as well. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them, lest we forget. Thank you, Jason. You can be seated. Let's pray this morning. 
We give thanks for each of our loved ones whom we remember today, for all the ways in which their lives touched ours, for the difficult as well as the good times, for the ways in which their lives and their love continue to be with us. In our sadness and with thanksgiving, we will remember them. Thank you, Jesus. Well, our lovely children, you can head off now with Vicky and the team because you are making our morning tea. I believe we're making some beautiful Anzac biscuits. You go. I'll come out soon. You go. Take Samuel with you. He can go and cook. <laughs> Do you think you can handle that, Vicky? <laughs> John, take Samuel. Thank you, children. We're looking forward to eating the fruits of your labours this morning. That will be really good. Uh, sorry, slight issue here with the independent one-year-old. <laughs> Thanks, Rach. I also believe it's the independent one-year-old why we had some troubles streaming to you online this morning. So I do apologise that you didn't have sound, uh, but I'm very thankful that Russell was able to contact Dion at the last minute to get it organised. But I wanted to share this with you this morning. The last post, which was the first sound that Jason played this morning, has become associated with war remembrance and military funerals. I remember hearing this sound probably since I was born. I don't know about you, for me, growing up in a military family was normal, but since I've grown older, I've realised not everybody has, and some families don't even have any military connections. But for me, it was just part of it. It was just part of our life. This sound, called The Last Post, dates back to the mid-19th century when it was played at the graves of soldiers who had died in conflicts abroad. The idea being that the call of the end of the day was also to signify the end of life. So it was very much out of respect. In the same way, I love to remember Jesus' famous last words on the cross. Do you remember them? It is finished. They might just be three words, but they are three words that changed the course of history. After our one minute silence, we heard the next sound, which I always thought was the Ravelli, but it's actually Reveille. I know it sounds like it's just a bit of a play on words, but it's actually a French word from Les Reveil, and it's a bugle call, which is what Jason was playing this morning, which signifies and was used chiefly to wake up the personnel in the morning, to wake up our army, to wake them up ready for the day. This name is obviously from the French, and we pronounce it Reveille, but it's the French word for wake up. It was like their alarm, morning alarm clock, you might say. I remember when I was in the army cadets, we used to hear this every day, and it was quite loud, and it was quite early, and it used to go off when it was cold and dark. It was the start of the day. For many of us who attend dawn services tomorrow, you'll see all this again and feel all this again, no matter where you are. And I encourage you to attend a dawn service tomorrow. I encourage you to bring your children up with the understanding of what the Anzac Day is all about. I remember a few years ago, my brother-in-law, Eddie, who you'll meet on the screen just soon, uh, he used to march with his children through the main street of Brisbane. But someone in politics, in all their wisdom, deemed that it wasn't safe for children to march anymore, so they scrapped it. But arms went up in a blaze of glory saying, how can you do that? How can you take away from this opportunity of storytelling with our children? So very quickly, you might say, they reversed that decision and children are allowed to once again walk with their dads, their mums, uncles, aunties, grandparents, whoever they are. And as you can see from this morning, Les is wearing his medals on his left chest. That means that the person who is wearing them on the left side, they are their medals. They're wearing them over their heart. But if you were to wear somebody else's medals this morning, and we have Chris Roach um, gear here today, if I was wearing Chris's medals, I would wear them on my right side. So that's how you can tell if it's the person who owns them or if they're wearing it out of remembrance or respect for somebody else. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> 
In the same way that we continue on with yearly Anzac Day commemorations, we do this to tell our children the story. The story of those that went before us, probably one of the greatest stories in Australian history. We tell it over and over again. If you're ever unsure about what you can use to show your kids or help them, you just have to do a quick Google search. YouTube is full of resources, different things that you can use to share these stories with your kids to make sure that our children never forget the great sacrifice that took place. You know, each Sunday we take communion here at church. Well, this church does, not all churches do. Uh, but I'm a strong believer in taking communion every Sunday, not just when it suits me or when it fits the service, but every Sunday. Our Bible says to us, or Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me as often as you gather. So that means you don't just have to wait for church on a Sunday, you can even do it in your own home, which I know many of you are accustomed to do, but maybe others today need to hear that you can take communion on any day of the week. You can take it by yourself, but we will always take it on a Sunday at this church because I believe it is so important. It's part of the storytelling. It's a part of the way that we share to remember Jesus. Wouldn't it be a travesty if our kids only were ever exposed to communion at Easter time? They might sort of think, what's this about? That's once a year, but imagine hearing it 52 times a year. They're surely going to remember what Jesus did for them. So Anzac Day... And church and communion have a lot of similarities and symbols. We eat Anzac biscuits. We were talking about this this morning with Marlene. She might be in the kitchen. Uh, I said to Marlene, what brand of tea do we have in the kitchen? Is it the same stuff that our soldiers took overseas? And she said, well, it wasn't bush tea, but it might have been bushels. I thought, well, that's all right. So we'll have a strong cup of bushels this morning and some Anzac biscuits, which I believe uh, our very thoughtful team are making in both gluten and gluten-free varieties. So if you're gluten-free this morning, they're also looking after you. That's how thoughtful our beautiful kitchen team and kids volunteers are. But we will take communion every Sunday to remember the incredible cost that Jesus paid with his life. I wonder this morning if you will grab your emblems. Uh, mine apparently was consumed by a one-year-old, but lucky here's one we prepared earlier. See, I can keep saying he's one Beck because he's not yet two, but MJ's two this week, I think. But let's grab our emblems out this morning. Let's hold him in our hands and remember. Remember our Jesus. His body that was broken for us. It was Easter was only last weekend, can you believe it? His body that was broken for us and his blood that was shed for us. And this is what we remember every Sunday, not once a year, but every Sunday. It's the story that we tell our kids. It's not really a story. It is a story, but it's a true story. We keep telling them. We keep talking about it. It's amazing at different ages of understanding what children know and remember and what they can share back to you. I find it so rewarding to talk to our kids about it. I think I was telling you last week, Samuel just, he just is just waiting for the juice. Like as soon as there's juice, he's happy. Jonathan understands a little bit more, but Josh has a great comprehension of communion. What's your comprehension of communion this morning? Do you remember Jesus on the cross? Do you remember the Jesus who rose again? Do you remember the Jesus who suffered for you? Maybe you remember all of those things. But let's take our communion this morning, giving thanks. Jesus, we thank you. Your body that was broken for us, your blood that was poured out for us, so that today we can live in this same freedom that the Anzacs fought for. We thank you, Jesus, your incredible sacrifice. Words will never be enough. But we just take this this morning with grateful hearts. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And your blood that was poured out for us. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 
I hope if you're joining us online this morning that you also partake of communion with us. Uh, I know there's quite a few online this morning who have requested prayer, so let me just read out uh, the prayer requests that have come in today. Uh, we need to pray for Samantha, who is sick with COVID. I can't say Samantha's last name. Can you say it? Sam Sam? No, she doesn't have a last name. Too hard for me. Yeah, too hard for me. Let's just pray for Sam this morning. Uh, Sam is suffering COVID. She would like prayer this morning. Uh, Sam Phelan is also suffering a sports injury after football yesterday. I believe some severe muscle, is that severe muscle tearing or something? Poor old Sam. I did tell Sam if he came to church this morning, I'd lay hands on him. He said he'd prefer it over Wi-Fi. So still praying for you this morning, Sam. Uh, Wendy, our beautiful sister Wendy is back in the Philippines. Wendy's auntie who raised her has passed away, so she's back being with her family. And of course, Mari is here this morning. We want to pray for you. Uh, is there anybody else who needs prayer this morning? I haven't been back on to check if there was any more messages. But that's all right. Why don't we pray for these people, hey? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with faith. Lord, knowing that your word says to pray, pray for the sick and they will recover. Lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Father, we pray for Samantha this morning, not able to be with us due to distance and obviously her illness. And Father, we just pray for her body this morning and those of her around her who are also sick this morning. God, we just speak healing into her body in Jesus' name. God, we declare your healing power, Lord, from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. Lord, we just know that she loves you and she wants to get back to work and she wants to resume life. So we just pray in Jesus' name for her healing. God, we pray for Sam this morning. Sam, if you're watching online, why don't you lay hands on your injury this morning? God, we pray for Sam. We thank you, Jesus, that the extent of his injuries are not as bad as first thought. But Lord, we do pray for this muscle that's torn, Lord, in Jesus' name. God, we speak to that muscle. We declare, we prophesy that you will be sewn back together, that you will sew back together neatly, that you will come together and Sam will be without pain and he will be able to just move on. Lord, we thank you for your healing power in Sam's life. Lord, we pray for our sister Wendy back in the Philippines today with her family. God, we just know that at this time of grief, we thank you, Jesus, that you walk with us, that you are with us. Lord, that we can bear one another's burdens and we pray for Wendy today. Lord, as she grieves her auntie that raised her, Lord, that she would know that precious peace of her Lord Jesus Christ to be around her. We thank you, Jesus. And God, we pray uh, for our sister Mari this morning. Maybe if Pastor Kevin and Wendy would like to lay hands on Mari there in front of them. Church, why don't we reach our hands out to Mari this morning? I think many of us were uh, overjoyed to see you this morning, Mari, as I'm sure you were. But Lord, we just stand on your word. Your word, Father, that says we can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Lord, this morning we lay hands on Mari. We thank you in Jesus' name. Lord, that she is well enough to be home this weekend, well enough to be here with her church family. And God, in the name of Jesus, we just declare your healing touch, God, from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. Lord, we speak to cancer in the name of Jesus. We curse that thing. We command it to return to the pit of hell. And in Jesus' name, God, as those, those tumors and those grow shrink in Jesus' name. God, we know that our sister Mari will return in full health. God, even better health, even more energy than before. Lord, ready to continue with what it is that you have for her. God, as she continues to walk through this valley of the shadow of death, God, she feels no evil. Lord, your rod and your staff, they comfort her. You're guiding her. You're leading her. You're healing her. Father, we pray for Les this morning. What an incredible man. Not only to have been a returned serviceman, but Lord, to walk beside his wife through one of the hardest battles that life would throw at them. We pray your blessing on them, Jesus. Strengthen them. Encourage them. I believe their wedding anniversary is in the coming days. And we thank you for them, Jesus. We thank you for your healing touch, Lord. Lord, we just pray for anybody else, either here or online, Father, that needs healing in their body. We just lay hands on wherever that is, and we believe for that healing in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for your promises. 
We thank you for the promises in your word and we pray and prophesy them over people this morning. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name and everyone who agrees said? Amen. Amen. Hey, I want to introduce you to some people this morning. If we can throw them up on the screen, Dion, you might actually recognize this first person. You actually may not. You might need to put your magnifying glass on to see in this photo. There's one or two people here this morning that would know what they're looking for. I can, is it coming? I can just keep talking. But it's a pretty good photo. And see if you can get the right answer. There's not really a, a prize if you do. Maybe just the honour of knowing that you got it right. That's a pretty good prize. <laughs> Here it is. Can you spot Les? Can anyone see Les? While you're looking, I'm just going to have a drink of water. I know Les and Mari can spot Les. He's which one? <laughs> so Les knows which one he is. Can anyone guess? Which, tell me how many numbers in from the left do you think he is? The fifth one, someone said over here. Mike, anyone else? Does anyone think it's this one? This one? This one? This one? This one? You're all right. That's Les. Les, everyone recognised you. How did we recognise you? And see, the funny thing is, Les sent it to me and I knew that was him, but I don't actually know how. Anyway, so that's Les. That was taken in 1969. Do you still have that uniform, Les? Long gone. Long gone. So there you are. Look at that. That's with a... Did you say that was a field service truck? Oh, oh there you go. No doubt uh, one of those good Australian inventions, I'm sure. Let's keep clicking through the photos. I'll introduce you to some more people. If it plays the game. Or this is, obviously, as you can see, an aircraft landing in Bougainville in February 1999. Keep clicking, Dion. The next one, this is, we're going to talk about this morning, is Operation Bell EC, a peacekeeping, peace monitoring operation post a 10-year war. And the next slide, who is that? That's my sister. And it didn't look like me, though. When I saw that, I thought it was me. And then I thought, it can't be. I've never worn that uniform. That's not me. But that's my older sister, Melanie, on her first deployment overseas. Next slide. She was also there in the peacekeeping operation for two months, where she later met, drum roll please, Eddie, Warrant Officer Class 2, Eddie Ballarizo, who is now my brother-in-law. Eddie was overseas serving in this same peacekeeping mission for nine months. They had a great time over there. Next slide. There you go. So Eddie served there for nine months and they later married in 2001. So it was less than two years after they met. There you go. That's pretty special. Is there more there, Dion? No. That's the end, I think. Let me tell you another story. If you can see all this gear to, which is my right, your left, this is a beautiful story. Some of you would know this young man. You may even know this story. Well, let me share it with you. This equipment here belongs to Chris Roach. Chris was born and raised in Warrantnabeel. You can come and check this out after the service if you want to. There's an active photo of him, and I'll explain to you in just a moment where he is. It's also his gear out in the foyer, which Rachel put on display for us. Thank you, Rach. This is his desert uniform for when he was serving in Iraq. Let me tell you his story this morning. Chris, this is in his words. In 2011, I was deployed to Afghanistan for MTF3, which is the Mentoring Task Force 3, with the Royal Australian Army. My job was to drive an ASLAV, which is the Australian Light Armoured Vehicle. At the time, I left behind my wife, Tegan, who was 20 weeks pregnant with our first child. It was, to this day, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. My deployment was to go for 12 months. I would do three months pre-deployment training in Townsville, 
to eight months overseas. We arrived in Afghanistan during the summer and the hottest day that I experienced. It was more than 58 degrees inside the driver's hole of the Aslav. When I left, it was winter and the coldest day I experienced, minus seven degrees. My time overseas was quite an experience due to the views of the country at the time, the way they lived, the way they did things on a day-to-day -day basis. I'll never forget the way children would approach me simply to ask me for a pen or food or water. During my trip, we had our fair share of engagements. One in particular went for three days. In that three days, one of our vehicles, a Bushmaster, hit an IED, an improvised explosive device and destroyed it, causing spinal, am spinal damage to the rear shooter who had to be flown away. The crew commander and the driver walked away shaken but unharmed. One of our main jobs while I served overseas was to mentor the local Afghanistan National Army on how to improve their skills and being able to do their jobs right and to acceptable standards from searching people, vehicles and buildings weapon skills, and identifying an IED. On our trip, we came across a lot of IEDs in the ground, and one of the hardest ways to find these was by vehicles hitting them. We never had any people killed in my vehicle, but three of my mates, who I walked alongside, did die that way. Halfway through our tour, I was entitled for two weeks' leave, on which I worked out I would be home in time to see the birth of my first child. I was on the way home. I was in Dubai just 24 hours away when I received the call. Tegan had given birth to our son, Seth. It was very upsetting to me that I didn't make it home in time. But I was very glad both of them are healthy and well. After my two weeks off, it was time to leave again and finish my tour. To this day, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Seth was two weeks old. After eight months serving in Afghanistan, alongside some of my closest friends, I did return home to my family. I took some time off work to spend with Tegan and Seth before returning back to work in Brisbane. I was told soon after I would be put on another course which meant I'd be sent overseas for another six months to Afghanistan. It was at this time I decided to discharge myself from the Australian Defence Force and to put my family first. Once my paperwork went through to discharge, we as a family returned from Brisbane back to Warwick Neville, where we still are, living now with our two sons and my wife, Tegan. Some of you may know Chris, and if you see Chris, I met him at an Anzac Day service, him and his brother both served overseas together. And you'll, you'll probably see them here if you go to the service in Warwick tomorrow. He'll probably be at the front marching with his granddad with his black suit on, probably his beret. He didn't want to wear these tomorrow, which was why he was happy to lend them to us. Chris actually wanted to be here this morning and share that story with us himself, uh, but he had another engagement to go to. But he is very passionate about the army, very passionate about sharing his experience and obviously his sacrifice. And as Christians, I believe we know all too well about the sacrifice that people made because we remember Jesus every week. We remember what he did every week. And we do talk about it. Well, the Bible says, greater love has no man than to lay down his life for his friends. And this is what Chris did. This is what Chris's friends did. And he returned to Australia without three of his closest mates incredibly tough. But these are our heroes. I want to share another story this morning. This is from Field Marshal Montgomery. I believe Andrea's heard this story. As an infant watching Tasmanian soldiers depart for the Boer War, Bernard Law Montgomery told his mother he was going to be a soldier when he grew up. Left for dead on the battlefield of Meteron during World War I, Captain Montgomery, not needing the grave already dug for him, went on to become the finest general in World War II, turning the tide against the previously invincible Rommel's German Axis forces in North Africa, 
with famous battles such as El Alamein and Tobruk. <clears throat> Montgomery, now field marshal, read two chapters of the Bible each day with devotions morning and evening as observed by one journalist who wrote after the Battle of Alamein. This was total war waged with more weight, power and concentration than the Nazi war machine had ever encountered and directed by a master of total war. A man who said his prayers in his desert tent night and morning and quoted the Bible to his troops to make them better fighters. Montgomery's father had been a bishop in Hobart at the turn of the 20th century. His wife said this in a Bible success banned booklet written in 1945. She says, I wonder how many of the readers have been brought up to learn a verse from the Bible every day. I was brought up to do this and as a consequence, now I nearly know all the Psalms and most of the New Testament by heart. And I brought my children up to learn a verse from the Bible every morning before breakfast. It just may be that Field Marshal Montgomery's knowledge and love of the Bible starts from this fact. As is well known, the two books he carries with him are the Bible and Pilgrim's Progress. England and America owe their greatness to the Bible. Let us pray that the Bible, God's word to us, may again take its rightful place in our hearts and homes. I would urge upon all my readers to do your utmost to bring the Bible back to your nation. And the best way to do this is to begin in your own home, with your own devotions, with your own children and to learn a verse of the Bible by heart each day. This was his wife quoted here. There's actually a photo here. If you have the word for today, you would have seen this was in today's reading. So there you go. Make sure you check it out. You know, as we remember everything our soldiers fought for, their greatest desire was peace. That's what they were fighting for. If you look around the world today, there is a lot of conflict taking place. Many are displaced from their homes. You know, some of us think it's only the war in the Ukraine that has displaced people, but there are more people around the world than just those in Ukraine. Many people are displaced many conflicts are taking place. Will you join with me this morning in praying for peace? Father, we come before you now. Today, April 24, tomorrow Anzac Day. Lord, we remember those in our church who served our loved ones, those near to us, and we thank them, Lord. We honour them. But God, we come before you now and we pray for peace. We pray for peace in our great nation of Australia. We pray for peace globally. We know, Jesus, that you are the Prince of Peace. You are a carrier of peace. And as believers, we too are carriers of that peace. Father, I pray as we go into our week and especially tomorrow on Anzac Day, Lord, that we would be mindful that we carry that peace where we go. Father, we pray for the upcoming election in our nation. We pray that righteousness would exalt this nation. God, we pray that you would speak to individuals, drop into our hearts, Lord, who it is that you would have us to vote for. Lord, there are good people in every party. There's lemons in every party as well. So God, we pray, give us wisdom. Give us wisdom, God, to know who to vote for in our specific area. Lower house, upper house, senate, everywhere. Give us wisdom, God, that we would know. Father, we pray for the conflict in, between Russia and Ukraine. Lord, we pray for justice. We pray for mercy. God, we pray for peace. Jesus, we pray you would intervene. Lord, that you would use us as your church, use believers as we continue to pray, God. We know our prayers don't go unnoticed. We thank you, Jesus.